This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Okay, everybody, welcome to This Week in Virology, episode number 143. We're recording on July 19th, 2011. Hi, everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Today we're recording in front of an audience at the 30th annual meeting of the American Society for Virology. We're in Minneapolis at the campus of the University of Minnesota. Joining me today, one of my old co-hosts from way back from the University of Florida at Gainesville, Rich Condit. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everybody. So, <laughs> man, it feels like one big happy family. Who knew, who knew that virology could be so much fun? This is you did. How's the weather in Gainesville, Rich? Uh, I was just looking at that. The weather in Gainesville is like 90 degrees and sunny, so, but I'm not in Gainesville. No, here it's pouring, although I think I see a break in the clouds out there. Also joining us today, from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, Julie Overbaugh. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Welcome. We're giving you uh, Seattle weather here, right? No, no, it doesn't rain this much in Seattle. No way. <laughs> Wait a minute. I was there for three days in February, and it rained every day. Not like this. No, a lot like that? OK. OK. Also joining us today from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, Stacy Schultz Cherry. Hi, thanks Welcome. for inviting me. Thanks for coming. Good to have you. What's the weather like in Memphis? Um, a little bit like it was yesterday, but I think Memphis was actually cooler than Minneapolis All right. the past few days. <laughs> so we also have a great audience here, and for those listening to this recording later, they're filing in because it's pouring. You're going to hear a lot of noise. They're eating lunch. Uh, you'll hear some feedback, but that, that's okay. We want to encourage you to ask questions. We have a couple of mics that people will give to you, wireless mics. Anytime, please ask. It's going to be recorded. And these things reach eventually 10,000 people per episode, these podcasts. We passed a million downloads not too long ago, which is really, really amazing. We are America's favorite talk show. <laughs> well, virology talk show. I think it's great. We're bringing virology beyond the lab, beyond the classroom, beyond even meetings like this and we can reach more people in one episode than we have in all the teaching and, and meetings that we've done in our whole careers. Uh, a reminder before we go on, please turn on your cell phones. Okay, we do like those chimes in the background. We don't mind at all. We need, uh, we need a little background music. All right, before we continue, I want to point out that the journal Virology has recently published a special issue of 24 review papers that cover a range of topics that match some of the themes here at the meeting. And Virology would like to offer you guys at this meeting and also TWIV listeners free online access to this issue in support of the podcast and this meeting. And there will also be printed copies of the issue available at the, at the booth uh, in the Radisson lobby. So we thank them for doing that. We'll put a link to that in the show notes so that our listeners can find those articles. And we thank Virology for for doing that. Rich, you think anything uh, about this meeting is particularly uh, notable? Uh, yeah, the whole thing is notable. It's, um, uh, it's terrific. I almost hate to pick something out because there's so much good stuff. Um, Steve Goff's uh, keynote address was great. Don Gannam always gives a good talk. He's the only guy in the known universe who can talk over a fire alarm, okay? <laughs> And uh, he could give the retro encabulator talk, all right? And, and it would make sense. You guys know what a retro encabulator is? All right, go to the last episode of TWIV. There's a, there's a link to that. So uh, Matt Evans here took a, a movie of the alarm going off during Don's talk, and it's up on the uh, TWIV Facebook fan page. So that's face, <laughs> facebook.com slash This Week in Virology, all all one word. We have, we're approaching a thousand fans there. It's very cool. So thanks, thanks for doing that. 
Uh, me, I feel the highlight was today's quote, I've, now I've forgotten who said it, it's not about us, it's about the virus. I thought that was pretty cool. You, can you think of anything you particularly like at this meeting? I've liked all the talks. I, yeah. You know, the, the diversity of the talks has been fantastic. How about you, Stacy? The talks have been great. The one that I would say the people in my lab are talking about the most was the chikungunya talk on the first day about viral diversity changing in mosquito saliva. Yeah. They, that had them all really excited. Well, this, there are, these are just a few things. This is a great meeting. I've heard all, all wonderful talks, and I really appreciate that we do this. And uh, we have to thank all the organizers and the speakers for, for getting together. This is really a unique meeting. And I think adding this kind of social media to it is really good, because we can spread what we do beyond uh, what we do here. I have been live tweeting some of the plenary sessions. And I have about 2,000 some followers on Twitter. And they are really grateful to hear little snippets of what's going on at this meeting. There are scientists who can't be here. There are people delivering mail who are following what's going on here at ASV. So it's very cool. So this, this media is just great. And I have to tell you, I stumbled on it. I just stumbled upon doing this, and it's had a life of its own. But enough about this. I think that's all I wanted to tell you initially. Let's start talking about some of the work that our guests uh, have done here. I'd like to start with you, Julie. And uh, I found a statement in one of your papers. I think it's a recent JV paper. There are no data showing a role for neutralizing antibodies in protection against HIV infection. So that was a surprise to me, and I wonder if you could explain that. Well, that must have slipped by the neutralizing antibody reviewers, right? <laughs> um, so one of the challenges in the HIV field is to take this concept that neutralizing antibodies should be able to protect against infection and actually show that they can. And because we don't have a vaccine that's efficacious or proven to be efficacious with known protective mechanisms, we can't really ask that question with a vaccine because there's no way to test um, efficacy of neutralizing antibodies without neutralizing antibodies elicited by the vaccine. And so if you really look at human studies and ask whether there's compelling evidence that neutralizing antibodies can protect, it's really not, uh, there's not consistent compelling evidence that that's true. It is true that in monkeys, if you set up the experiment in just the right way, you can actually see protective efficacy. So theoretically, it's possible. Just in practice, it's not clear to me that, that we understand this yet. So there's a really interesting historical uh, example from polio. It was, I think, in the 1940s that John Paul did a study in Alaskan Eskimos and showed that one subclinical infection gave you lifelong protection. So that's the kind of epidemic that you can't do at the moment with AIDS, with AIDS right? And I think the other thing with, with, um, with HIV that's important to notice is that people do get reinfected. So they, they mount an immune response to their first virus, and yet they can be infected by a distinct uh, strain from a second individual. So whether that's because the immune response isn't uh, potent enough, or whether it's because HIV is so diverse that the response isn't broad enough, I think we don't really understand. Now, you've got together a nice system to look at this question, right? The passage of antibodies from mothers to babies. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think one of the places you can try to get a handle on whether antibodies protect is in the setting of mother-infant transmission. Um, in HIV, this can occur in utero or during delivery or also if a mother breastfeeds. So when the infants born, they actually have a fairly high amount of antibody from the mom, including, of course, her HIV-specific antibodies. And if you ask whether those antibodies in the infant have any uh, correlation with whether or not the infant acquires HIV, unfortunately, we don't find that they do. So this was an experiment we did hoping that we could show a correlative protection in what kind of mimics a, a vaccine setting where the exposed individual has the antibodies, um, in this case from the mom. And, and we don't really see evidence that there's any protective effect of those antibodies uh, in that setting. So the mothers pass antibodies to the babies, then you follow which get infected and which do not. Correct. And both sets of infants have the same. That's right. So how do you measure the, what kind of strains do you use to measure these antibodies? Well, that's actually 
an important question. If, if you do these studies, I mean, all of you as virologists know, you can study a few animals, a few patients, if you get out every virus and study every virus that's in them. Um, you can't do big studies of hundreds of, of individuals unless you use sort of a panel of, of viruses that are representative rather than getting a virus from each person. And so in the screen that we did, we took a panel of viruses from the region where uh, the population we were studying um, was present. So this was in Kenya, and they have diverse HIV subtypes. So we picked viruses that we thought would be representative of what's circulating in the population there as a surrogate for looking at their ability to protect against uh, what they, these infants were exposed to. Now, the downside of that is that the, really the best way to do this is to look at each virus and each person and ask what was the capacity to neutralize that virus. And, and we are moving in that direction. I don't think we'll be able to do the 100 um, infant study in that scale, but we're moving in, in that direction to fine tune what we've been looking at in the prior study. So the idea would be to sample the mother's viruses at birth and see if those antibodies against those would correlate with protection. Would that right. be it, or would you look earlier and before birth even? Because they change as... That's right. Uh, I mean, that's actually an important, an important point. If you look at the different HIV studies, there's, um, you can see different data, partly depending on when you sample the transmitter and the infected individual, because as you're pointing out, I think the virus changes enough, both in sequence and in antigenicity. Um, and so we try to isolate viruses at the time or near the time within weeks of transmission from the index case, the mom in this case, and as soon as we can detect virus in the infant so that we're capturing a, a small window. And so in the study um, you were talking about, we, we are isolating from the mom if she's a transmitter right before she transmitted, and then in non-transmitting moms as our control group asking uh, at the same time point in, in pregnancy or after birth what do their viruses look like? Um, so that's our matching yeah, right. scheme. So do I, do I understand correctly that when transmission goes on, the virus goes through a genetic bottleneck, okay? Yeah. That you start out in a, in a given infected individual, you get this bloom of viruses that are highly variable genetically, and when they're transmitted, only a subset of those, one or two or something, actually uh, is in, infectious in the next individual. Have I got that right? Yes, that's correct. So uh, what's known mechanistically about how that happens? Why is that? Why is there this bottleneck? I think that's actually a big question in the field. In, in mother-infant transmission, you can see some of that bottleneck is imposed by antibodies. So the most neutralization-sensitive viruses tend to be selected against, implying that antibodies are playing some role, but they're, they're not protecting but they're selecting within the bottleneck. But in sexual transmission where antibody, passive antibody is not relevant, you still see this bottleneck. You see it in, in all settings in HIV. And people have looked and asked whether there's something about these viruses that make them successful for transmission because that could tell us where we should be targeting um, either prevention strategies, vaccines, some ways to block viral entry. And to date, really, there's no, not been clearly defined biological properties of these selected viruses. And so the debate in the field is how much of it is stochastic, which is probably part of it, because HIV transmission is relatively rare. Um, but some of it appears to be selection based on sequences of the viruses that get through. But, but we don't know the biological pressure that's really being applied to those transmitted viruses. So uh, HIV can be transmitted several different ways. So mother to child, sexually, through transfusion or IV drug use. Is the bottleneck different in any of those transmission scenarios or is it, or is it the same? That it's seems the to me same. Weird. It's the same. And uh, it, the only thing that really shifts the bottleneck are known cofactors that influence HIV acquisition anyway. So people who have sexually transmitted diseases um, which is a risk factor for acquiring HIV, they tend to acquire more viruses than people who don't have sexually transmitted diseases. But, but those biological cofactors play a role, but route, in all routes of transmission, there's a bottleneck. So in my uh, personal dogma about this, I have that part of the bottleneck results in 
the first virus that shows up is M-tropic, and then you get uh, evolution of other viruses. Do I have that straight, and does that give us any clues? Do we know why that is? I, you know, I think that that dogma is, is some things in the HIV field go like this. Well, that, that might be one of them. Okay. Um, Good. Uh, <laughs> You've got to ask these questions. Okay. But, but, they, but they, are, um, they are selectively uh, CCR5 using viruses, meaning they, they require that co-receptor for entry. Okay. And so the other viruses that use CXCR4, which is the less commonly used co-receptor for HIV, you rarely see those transmitted. So that does imply some sort of cell that expresses CCR5 as the initial target cell. And, and if the bottleneck is the same, regardless of transmission, that presumably that cell is going to be important at each transmission, Correct. regardless of root. Correct. Or, or some other cell that expresses CCR5, whether it's the same cell or a different cell, right. um, I think is unclear. So when you go forward and do these studies, which we spoke about, where you're looking at neutralization of viruses from the mother. What do you think you will find? Do you think you will find the same that you've already found? Well, we've, we've done enough that um, I think that we will find that there's no differences between the non-transmitting and transmitting mothers um, in terms of the sensitivity of their viruses to their own antibodies. And we've even started selecting mothers who by all criteria should transmit. So. Um, the amount of virus in the circulation is a major predictor of whether or not transmission occurs. So we went and picked from our cohort women who had very high viral levels and didn't transmit, thinking they might have uh, some different level of antibody that we would detect. And we're, we're, so far, we're not seeing it. Um, You're measuring serum antibodies, that's right? That's correct. So do other kinds... Would other kinds make a difference, do you think? Then We've actually looked in breast milk because a lot of the transmission events we're looking at are, are um, during breastfeeding because that's when passive antibodies are high in the infant. And we actually find very, very low levels of HIV-specific antibodies in breast milk and almost negligible neutralization potential of breast milk antibodies. So we don't think that they're playing a role. Could it be that the levels of antibodies are not high enough to make a difference, but if you had a vaccine that induced higher levels, that it, it might be protect, protective? Yeah, I think that's, I, I think that's really the issue. I, if, if we had the capacity to elicit higher levels of antibody, an antibody that could recognize diverse strains, I think you shift the bar on what you can protect against. So I had mentioned that um, there are cases where you select against the most neutralization sensitive viruses in the mom during transmission, mm -hmm. implying that there's some antibody protection, it's just not adequate. So if we had better antibodies and we had more uh, ability to recognize diverse strains, I think that bar would shift down. And okay. there are antibodies that have been isolated in the last two years that are much more potent from people who we would call elite neutralizers. You know, you screen 2,000 people, you take the person at the very top of that group, mm -hmm. and you pull out their antibodies, and they are much more potent than what we would see in these moms. So all, all this focus has been on antibodies. What about a cellular response? Yeah. I mean... Well, you, you know, the, again, I, it's another one of those HIV waves that we can do, but, but the way the field really began was to look at antibodies, and then we all went away from antibodies, and the focus shifted to cellular responses really because in HIV infection, if you look during chronic infection, antibodies don't seem to be controlling virus at all, whereas cellular responses actually do help control the virus during an established infection. So that was translated to thinking, well, maybe we could actually protect against infection with those same responses, which is kind of a big assumption that what controls an infection actually prevents infection. But, but the move in the field was really in that direction. And at least the first pass at those approaches didn't appear to be eliciting good enough responses and seeing any efficacy. And there was a trial that was based on that concept that, that failed. And so we shifted again. But I think um, most people in the field think that it would be best to have both. So if the antibodies can block the initial events um, and prevent uh, a robust infection, even if you get infected, perhaps those cellular responses can help control the the levels of virus, which will mean that the virus will, um, or the disease course would be uh, blunted at least in those individuals. 
So at, at one level, your conclusion is that neutralizing antibodies don't make any difference. And so that we can simplify it to that because I want to take the, let's, let's say uh, all the individuals who are running trials to induce antibodies, how have they, have they uh, reacted to that in any way? We've had some healthy debates. And, and I, I, w I would say that I, I'm not actually saying that they don't do anything because again, I made the point that in mother infant setting, you can see some protection against the most um, sensitive viruses. So they're just not good enough is what I would say uh, at the moment. Um, but I think there is a pretty healthy debate in the field. I actually had what I would call the equivalent of my oral exam about um, two months ago when I was at a meeting on neutralizing antibodies and I, I talked for 10 minutes and then I got grilled for half an hour. I sort of forgot what, what that was like, but it was, it was actually kind of fun. Um, I think there's, we kind of all agree in some way that what you need is better antibody responses, more potent, broader responses. I think we're, we're sort of looking at the data and, and, and being you know, optimistic in one way or another. Um, but I'm not really saying that they can't protect. And, and certainly, there's evidence that if you get the right antibodies, you can, you can do this. I just don't know how we're going to elicit that level of antibody if you can't get it in a sustained replicating infection over 10 years. Um, we don't at the moment know how to make more antibody than that. Are there other systems that you can study this in besides the, the mother-child one that you've used? So the other place that we've looked is in the setting of um, super infection where people are getting reinfected and tried to understand if those individuals happen to be, um, have deficits in, in their immune responses. And we've looked at both cellular and antibody responses at this point, and we don't really see a difference that tells us that that those happen to be individuals who didn't respond well to their first infection. Um, the data from those studies are very similar to what we see in mother infants. But there are other groups who have this kind of intriguing data where they've looked at um, people who are highly exposed but HIV negative, And they find in some of these individuals that there's what appears to be an HIV-specific IgA response um, that correlates with protection. Now, this is controversial because some people believe there's not an IgA response that's HIV-specific, but they're starting to show this in multiple studies, this correlation. So, so there are other groups that are looking at these exposed, uninfected individuals to see if there's any protective mechanism that's induced by repeat exposure. So there may be things that come out of that that are surprising, I think. So we, we had a listener who wrote in suggesting a paper for our attention that seems to me relevant to this whole thing. Uh, are you familiar with this paper, Profound Early Control of Highly Pathogenic SIV by Effector, T -cell, effector, memory, effector memory T cell vaccine using a persistent CMV vector? Are you familiar with that? So that's the Oregon group, I think, that did that. I, I've seen some of that data. I, I can't recall if I read the paper. Yeah, let's get it up here. We, can, we have an internet connection. Uh, I got, I got yeah, it's this one. It's a Nature paper. It just came out in May. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's the... So, the, so the, some of these studies, I think this is one of the vectors where they're starting to show um, evidence that they can control infection with good responses. But what's important about most of these animal studies, extremely important to think about, is they're using a matched immunogen and virus. And so there are certainly systems, this is maybe one of the best ones we've seen to date, where you can see um, some protection if you use an exact antigen that you're going to challenge with. And, and the hard part about that is that, you know, that's not going to be what happens in the real world. And so I think that's why translating this into HIV-specific immunogens and doing clinical trials, we this haven't been able to see the same kind of benefit. The whole paper, but just from the abstract, it looked to me like... They were expressing SIV antigens on a CMV vector, so they're establishing a persistent latent infection. It struck me as yes. a really novel way to administer a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think those, those approaches are more appealing, again, even from the antibody side, um, in part because the kind of antibodies that are more broadly neutralizing have to um, hypermutate to, and evolve to become have enough affinity for the, the HIV envelope to be potent. And so I think these vector approaches will be useful. But again, I think we'll, the next phase is going to have to be, can you protect against a virus that's 
different in sequence from the immunogen. Does SIV do the same sort of evolution in its natural host? As, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a very similar, it, this is actually not its natural host, so the, the studies that are done with SIV are in non-natural hosts, because natural hosts don't get, it, get um, the disease. Right. Okay. Is it also passed from monkey to child in the same way? Uh, yeah. yeah, there's studies that show you can, you can um, transfer through uh, oral transmission to, okay. to macaques as well. So you could use that to do different kinds of studies than you can do in people. Then. Yes, and right. there are labs, including groups at Oregon, not that group, who are, um, who are successfully using that model. Any questions from the, uh, the audience for Julie before we move on? You can, this is your chance to become immortalized. There you go. Immortalized, yes, like a fibroblast. <laughs> Human CMV has been found to have the capacity to superinfect. So do you think in terms of designing these vector vaccines when we're using CMV, would it be important to utilize antigens that are specific for HIV and then update the vector as we find more antigens and just super infect again and again with this vector vaccine, modifying it? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know enough about CMV. This is the notorious problem with HIV people, not general virologists. Um, but uh, I think that the idea, the general idea of being able to increase the antigen diversity in the vaccine is probably going to be important. I can't imagine we're ever going to have a couple antigens that give the kind of breadth that we need. And so, uh, in, in fact, what we've recently shown is that people who do get super infected, when you look at what happens to their, the breadth of their response, it actually takes off when you put two very distinct viruses in. So this idea of adding antigens, I think, makes sense um, in the long run. Anyone else? So we're going to hear more about this tomorrow, right? Yes. So the last talk of the entire meeting. Well. <laughs> so we'll see how many people are I'll still here. I'll be there. I'll be there. Um, I wanted, before we move to Stacy, I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about your, your history. How did you end up at the Fred Hutchinson? Um, well, I have a little bit of an atypical history. I, I went to graduate school and um, I actually left a couple times to do various things, and then I went back and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not really, this isn't what I want to do. So I went off and did a fellowship that, that was more interdisciplinary. I was trained as a biochemist and uh, got really interested in things that, where you translate basic science to public health. And it was just when HIV was emerging and, and that kind of combination was appealing for me. Um, I went first to the University of Washington for 10 years in the faculty and then uh, was offered a position at the Fred Hutch, which of course is a cancer center. Um, but part of the appeal for me and I think for them was that we had started doing very translational interdisciplinary science, looking at populations and trying to bring basic science all the way through to population-based studies. And so it was a really nice match for me and it's, it's been a great place to to uh, work as a virologist, I must say. So you've been at the Hutch your entire career, basically? I was faculty. at the university for 10 years, and I was at, I've was at i been at the Hutch for 12. As a faculty member yes, both times. Both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stacy, how about you? How did you end up in Tennessee? I also have kind of a convoluted scientific history. I didn't really want to go into science, but my dad is a immunologist, and he pretty much made me. <laughs> It was, I will not pay for college unless you study biology. But I, I worked in the lab, enjoyed it, and my training's actually in cellular biochemistry and wound healing. Um, and thought, viruses cause great wounds. You know, sometimes there's too much, like papilloma, and a lot of times you don't repair, and decided to do a postdoc in virology, and it was very short postdoc, because um, the USDA came a-calling. Um, I went and gave a talk, and USDA saw me and invited me to join um, a poultry lab, which I was not real thrilled about because I, I don't even eat chicken. I definitely <laughs> didn't want to uh, work with them. But I had both my kids in graduate school, and so I thought if I go right into academics, I'm not going to see my kids, and, and took a job at USDA for five years where I was a lead scientist but got really lucky in, in some respects because when I got there, within about a month, highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses transmitted in Hong Kong for the first time into humans. And we were the, really the only facility that had the high containment laboratories to be able to deal with this. 
So great opportunity, but new government was not quite my thing. And got a faculty position at University of Wisconsin and was tenured and on faculty there for about eight years and absolutely loved it, loved the teaching, um, taught undergraduate virology where I, lear I learned a lot since I was not trained as a virologist. I think I slept through the majority of my virology class at, at UAB. Um, and then again went to St. Jude to give a talk because I had a lot of colleagues there and they made me one of those offers you couldn't refuse. And it was an offer because, I guess like Julie, I was really interested in population and, and more of the public health and bringing what we were doing in the laboratory to a larger population so that you could go to your grandma and say, this is what I work on and this is why it's important. And what St. Jude had is they had Centers for Excellence for Influenza, which was fantastic, so a lot of collaborations. But they're also a World Health Organization collaborating center. And we're the only center that does anything at the animal-human interface. And so they said, you come, we'll give you the opportunity to interact and interface with the WHO. So now I get to go to the meetings twice a year in Switzerland where you choose what the new vaccine strain is going to be for influenza virus. And that's been really exciting and very, very different. And so now even the lab thinks about things differently. You do the very basic science, but how are you going to apply this in terms of a big picture and how's it going to help in terms of public health? So you don't regret your dad making you do that, right? Yeah, there are days, I think. <laughs> <laughs> my, dad, my dad thought I was weird for going into science. So really? I had to well, my dad thought I was weird, but he thought it would fit for <laughs> science. But, um, you know, it, there are easier careers. Sure. And, and you tell your students this, but it's so much fun and it's so rewarding. You know, I can't think of a job where every day you get to go and have fun in the lab and do things that are, yeah. are really exciting. Well, I tell people this is the best job you can have. You, with all the difficulties, it, you get to think about what you want to think about every day mm -hmm. and no one tells you what to do. Well, we tell each other what to do through peer review, more or less, right? right. <laughs> so at, at, when you went to Wisconsin, did you take flu with you and worked on it there? I did. I did. So the lab focuses on influenza virus, but we also work on astrovirus, which is an enteric virus. And so we took both of those models with us to Wisconsin, and that's what we continue okay. to do. Should we talk a bit about astroviruses since we have never mentioned them on TWIV? Sure. Good idea. And I'd like to know what the connection in your mind is, aside from they both have nucleic acid and a capsid between <laughs> flu, flu and astroviruses. Is there a connection there? Um, we're trying really hard in the laboratory to make some kind of connection because <laughs> it becomes very difficult to keep up with two very, very different projects. Um, and being trained in cell biology, I'm really interested in the cellular biology of the viruses. And with the astroviruses, we've actually found, so they're enteric viruses, you all will have antibodies to them, I promise you. Do, do this whole thing. Right? What do you want me to do? The, the yeah, open reading know, frames? Single stranded RNA. Single stranded, RNA. yes, the virus, single stranded RNA, very simple, about 7 KB. You will find it in every oh. species that you look in, I can guarantee you, especially in the young. Positive and sense RNA. Positive sense RNA, yep. N not enveloped. Well, I can give you the lecture I used to give my no, undergrads. Just, okay. you know, not, no. The viral zone thing, Yep, right? non-enveloped, incredibly stable in the environment, which makes a lot of sense because they're fecal oral. Um, so every animal you look in has antibodies yeah, to Yeah, in fact, ways? we just found monkey astro. So every animal, um, you will continue to get infected through life. Um, we really don't understand, unlike norovirus or rota, if there's a lot of asymptomatic, if there's an age dependent. I know everybody loves talking about diarrhea when they're eating lunch, so. <laughs> but um, we, we found, we have the only small animal model to study astrovirus pathogenesis that just happens to be baby turkeys. Baby so, turkeys. There you go with the chicken thing again. I know. I, there's I can't, the connection. I can't get away from them. Right. Yeah. You eat turkey? No. <laughs> Um, but they get age-dependent disease just like humans, and with this model we were able to really characterize where astroviruses replicate, um, and we were quite surprised to find that if you just take the viral capsid protein by itself and express it, it forms viral-like particles, 
and it's a viral enterotoxin. So if you just feed it to, literally, they just swallow it, they will get diarrhea. And so we then had to move into an in vitro model, and we can take human intestinal epithelial cells and allow them to differentiate. So they basically form intestines. In culture, they secrete mucus. I mean, they're fantastic. If you add the capsid protein, it, will, it doesn't kill the cells, so a little unlike flu. It actually causes the tight junctions to open up. And so what you see is that the cells come apart and you start getting fluxes of um, ions and things like that. And it, it's a great way you can add something to the apical surface and it will now translocate to the basolateral. And you could see where this would be a really bad thing in vivo and it explains a lot of the diarrhea. So is this a, is this a disease that, is it, uh, are there a lot of asymptomatic infections or are they mostly symptomatic? We really don't know. Okay. Um, we know obviously about the symptomatic um, big problem in terms of daycares and now in adult care facilities are having a lot of astrovirus outbreaks. But that's what we're doing at St. Jude is, is we can now look in the patient population which you would think you know, if, if there's going to be evidence, because there's, there's um, evidence in the literature that it may go persistent in certain populations, and Ian Lipkin actually found an astrovirus in the brain of a child with some neurological disease. So they may at least, they may be able to go systemic, and they do in the turkey model. They will go systemic. So I think I have heard that there is some interspecies transmission going on with these, is that right? That's what we're starting to see. Um, and we can actually put the human astrovirus capsid protein or the virus in the baby turkeys and they will get sick. And we can put the turkey capsid on the human cells and open up tight junctions. And so that's what we're starting to look for is do we have evidence of interspecies transmission? So that could in part account for repeated infections? Absolute, absolutely, because even if the virus won't replicate, if all you need is the capsid getting in there to cause disease. Mm -hmm. So that is a problem if you wanted to make a virus-like particle vaccine because it would be a toxin, right? Right. So we've talked about that is, is if you wanted to use the VLPs as a vaccine, you're going to get a few days of diarrhea, but as long as you can get neutralizing or good cellular immune responses, it may protect you. But it, it also evolves. It's an RNA virus. And so we're seeing a lot of evolution. And in the St. Jude kids, we're starting to see evidence of recombination. So we did some retrospective studies. And in January, so the same time frame, we had different kids with completely different subtypes of astrovirus. We found some recombination. And then co-infections with norovirus. Would it be possible to alter the capsid so it were antigenic but not a toxin? That's exactly what we're trying to do. The problem is we don't have a structure. So the structure has not been solved. We actually have crystals now working with some structural biologists at, at St. Jude. And if we can solve that structure, um, the problem was there was nothing like it in the database. So now they're having to soak in heavy atoms and really solve a brand new structure. Mm -hmm. And then the next goal will be to find what's the toxigenic domain and try and... So it sounds like we're, we're uncertain of the prevalence in the U.S. So we're not at the point where a vaccine is absolutely necessary? Right. It's, it's typically a very acute diarrhea. So it's something that as a parent or if you get it, you know, your kids will be sick for a couple days. But it's not like a rotavirus infection. But we don't know enough about it to say in immunocompromised or the elderly, if it goes persistent and even systemic, is it something we need to consider vaccines for? So when you have gastro viral gastroenteritis, this, this could be a fraction and we just don't know. We blame it on noro or Absolutely. rota, but this could be it as yeah. well. Because if you get sick and even if you go into the doctor, they're going to say, ah, you have stomach flu, which is not influenza virus. That was my big take home message when I was teaching the undergraduate virology. So it's just diarrhea or it's vomiting and diarrhea? It can be both. So on my other, one of my other podcasts this week in microbiology, one of our guests called that a two-bucket disease. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to a one-bucket, which would just be either vomiting or diarrhea. So this is a two-bucket? It's, it's a two-bucket two disease. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, we had, an, uh, we had an email from someone who wanted us to make a logo with two buckets saying... <laughs> I should have listened to TWIM. I, I think the lab will like 
thinking about it more as a two bucket rather than me calling them fecal fanatics. They don't fecal fanatics. Yeah. So uh, you also work on flu, right? I do. Do you have a favorite? Astro, flu? Um, you know, I, I really like the astrovirus, um, mostly because there's so much that we can do with it. I mean, we, we don't even know how it replicates. I mean, we know nothing about it. We don't know receptors. So it's a lot of fun to get in there and, and do those studies. And it's, you don't worry about getting scooped. You know, <laughs> so that's a big thing. And so I have all of my lab, everybody does an astro in an influenza project because influenza is a very competitive field. Lots of unanswered questions, a lot of very exciting questions. How does the virus transmit? How does it cross species barriers? How do we make better, more effective vaccines? So there's still a lot of work to be done too. But the astro is always my little... Can you actually grow this in culture? We, some of them. So the human astroviruses, um, some of those we can, other ones we can't, and we don't know about this monkey astrovirus yet. Can you do a plaque assay? No. <laughs> I can't do a plaque assay. That's the better thing about flu is it, it will kill the cell so you can see it. With astrovirus, it is non-cytopathic. Even in vivo, we actually, we see an evidence that there's less cell death. So you have this culture and you have no idea if the end of the week, it's going to be a good week, or did you not grow any virus? So how, you, so how do you know? How do you assay it? You got... So we have to do. We have Eliza's, and now we have real time okay. PCR. Yeah, you you wouldn't like that virus, Rich. No, no plaques. No, no plaque. No plaque. I mean, not even a cytopathic effect. We've tried. We've tried My black. <laughs> <laughs> we've tried black plaque assays of that, but could never get them to work. You had a. I went to uh, talks from your lab yesterday at the workshops. No, oh, thanks for that. And you had a uh, somebody from your lab gave a talk with a very fat mouse. Yes. Okay. Tell me about that. We were talking about this before the podcast. Right. It's really interesting stuff. So this is kind of the the new area of interest in the laboratory. I'm notorious for letting you know. I want my people to carry out their own interests, so we end up going in these different directions. So during the 2009 influenza virus pandemic, for the very first time, there was epidemiologic evidence that obesity was a risk factor for developing severe flu. And never been seen before. Now, maybe it's because of population. We like to say it's an expanding population of people. <laughs> um, but we decided we wanted to go in and see, is that true? I mean, is that really real? So we used diet-induced obese mice, which you saw a picture of. Um, and genetically obese mice, which we've had some 70, 80 gram whoppers. And if you've ever worked, you know, most mice are 20 grams, but these guys are... The diet-induced uh, obesity was really striking. Yeah. So we're talking about this. You feed, what, what is it you feed these guys? We feed them a high-fat diet, so it's like a Happy Meal. You know, it, it's <laughs> these blue pellets that are 60% fat, and the mice get very greasy, and they grow... I mean, this is, we put them on the diets for eight to ten weeks, and they get really large. Do they watch a lot of TV? They do. <laughs> <laughs> they sit down there with their food. That was mentioned in a talk yesterday, the Western diet, they called it. Is yeah. it the yep. same thing? Yep, that's... The that's, equivalent of burgers and shakes. And that's something we're going to get into is Eastern versus Western diet, because it's probably more than just obesity. It probably has a lot to do with nutrition. And I don't think it'll be flu-specific. But it just amazes me. I guess it shouldn't amaze me that these mice will do this to themselves. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of evidence that animals will do this to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they really, they look like bean bags in the cage. So they're really, there's a little nose and then this body. Um, but we found that they're very, very susceptible to influenza infection. And it's not because the viral titers are higher. It's because of the obesogenic state, there's a lot more inflammation, and they don't seem to be able to repair well, which I guess makes a lot of sense. So they're not able to repair their lungs during an infection, so you get edema, and that's never a good thing. But the talk um, is, it's not just that you're more susceptible to flu, but the virus is actually evolving differently in an obesogenic state. So what my postdoc did is passage the virus through lean or obese mice, and the virus that came out of obese mice was very different. It, it's more virulent, even when you put it back into a lean mouse, and we don't know why yet. And these are infected intra 
intranasally. Nasally. So you're looking at lung replication. Absolutely. So is there more extensive pathology in the lung than the obese mass? No, there's not, surprisingly which is what we thought is that there would be more lung damage, and we didn't see that, but what we did see is this lack of repair. And we're trying to look at this over long term, so the ones that can survive, mm -hmm. do they repair and do we now get into a fibrogenic state rather than recovery? And it, the, uh, the infectious dose is no different. It takes the same amount of virus to infect them as a normal and, mouse. And, and when you actually look at what dose it requires, it's about three to four logs lower dose to get the same clinical signs of disease. So they're very much, much more susceptible. So what we want to do is we're going to make furry footballs in the lab. So this is going to be overweight ferrets because ferrets are really the best, some of the best models to look at influenza, especially transmission. And if you think about public health, that's where your risk is, is more susceptible is one thing, but if the virus changes and can now transmit more effectively, then we've got issues. So we're going to make um, fat ferrets. Great. Well, the ferret, I suppose the ferrets will do this themselves, too, if you... Oh, they will. Okay. That's, that's at least what we've... Everybody's pet ferrets are fats, but we just got in the food. We have to work with veterinary nutritionists, and it, it looks like green lard. It looks terrible. So we just have to make sure, first of all, the ferrets will eat it, but we've... <laughs> Well, we've talked to the veterinarians, and they said, throw in some bacon. They'll eat it. So <laughs> it's the same with people. Same yeah, with exactly. People. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, bacon. that's the bacon on the bacon cheeseburger. That's the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I fall for that every time. <laughs> the uh, microbiome influences obesity. So I'm wondering if in these mice there's an altered microbiome and that somehow is influencing repair. And that, right? that is a fantastic question, something that we've been thinking about and, you know, we house the obese and the lean mice separately. So we're thinking about if we co-house them, right. where then they start eating each other's microbiome. We're going back to the feces again, we really like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Will that at all influence the lean mice right. because that could be part of the issue. So do you know anything about exactly what the genetic changes are in the we don't. So we have the viruses, we're sequencing them um, to see if it's a genetic change. Are we getting changes in glycosylation? Or because during the obesogenic state you have different lipids, you really dip different lipid compositions, lipid levels, have we changed the envelope of the virus in some way? And again, I don't think this will be unique to influenza virus. It's been shown that with Coxsackie, if you have selenium deficiency or vitamin E deficiency, it can change and that the lipid component can really make a difference when you're talking about an envelope virus. So actually, I guess I'm assuming that these, you say that you get different viruses out of the obese mice. I'm assuming that these are actually genetically different. Is that true, or do you know? That's what know? we have to figure out. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any questions for Stacy? So you've, you have these obese mice, you give them the same infectious dose of influenza, and they have worse uh, results. So have you looked at all in any other respiratory tract infections? We, ha we haven't. Did everybody hear the question? So have we looked at any other respiratory tract infections? And we have not yet, but I think that's something that we'll need to do. I know that people have looked at things like, um, can I talk about a bacteria on a virology? Of okay. Sure. Yeah. sure. Um, they've looked at like listeria models, and in the obese animals, listeria is much, much worse. So I think this is just, I mean, this is a very different environment. It's inflammatory in one respect because all the adipose tissue and the macrophages are secreting a lot more cytokines, but the immune cells don't function properly. So you've got NKs and T cells that are not um, as active as they should be. Anyone else? Yeah, you mentioned that uh, many astrovirus species fail to replicate in tissue culture. Do you know what the basis for that failure is? We don't. Um, we have not been able to get, like our turkey astrovirus, we can't get that to replicate in cell culture. Um, we've tried primary turkey epithelial cells, everything, and we're just, either we don't have the right cell population or we're missing something in the media, because astroviruses require trypsin, at least the human ones, to replicate, and we know that we can also use pepsin. So we're either missing something in that media that they need, or we just don't have quite the right cell population. Yeah, we're over on that side, yeah. I don't know much about astroviruses, but uh, 
They don't have envelopes? They don't have envelopes. So, and they don't kill cells. So how do they get out of the cell? You know, that was the question that when I was at Wisconsin would talk about Astros, Paul Alquist would ask me, how are they getting out of the cells? And the answer is, I have no idea. Um, I don't know. They're opening up these tight junctions, and we can see that the astrovirus capsid during replication will bind to one of these tight junction proteins, occludin, which has now been endocytosed. And we don't know if it uses that as a way to traffic back out of the cell. So until we figure out a way to block this tight junction disassembly, then we can start figuring out how is the virus using this to its advantage. I've often wondered if the immune system couldn't uh, do that for the virus by killing the cells, lysing the cells. Is that crazy? No, not at all. But we don't see any inflammatory response with the astrovirus. So that's what makes it really unique, is you have all of this diarrhea without any cell damage or any inflammation, which is very, very different than a rotavirus. Any others? Okay. Well, here on TWIV, we get a lot of email. We get three or four a day from various listeners. In fact, that's how we can tell who's listening. Besides virologists, we have all sorts. We have, we've had some high school students all the way up to physicians of various sorts, nurses, we have laborers, I've had mail, mailmen, truck drivers, painters, policemen uh, listen, and they tell us about it. So I thought we would share a few emails today. And the first one is from Judy, who writes, hello people of TWIV, thanks for all the information you give and how you make me think. I really liked your discussions on TWIV 136 exit XMRV. Not as much for the science, which was cool, but for the discussion of the process of science. How it is not as linear as we often teach our students. I wish all my students could have heard this discussion, but I think many would get lost in the vocabulary of XMRV. It's true. I am a high school science teacher, previously a lab rat in biotech tech labs. I started in 1975, so I learned to do things without kits. <laughs> I thought it was just us old guys. <laughs> I remember when getting a milligram of plasmid from a liter of LB was a glorious thing. <laughs> now they get that from a mini prep. The hardest thing for kids to understand is how science works. There's a great website called Understanding Science, and she provides a link for that, which greatly helps. Judy Scotchmore and other people in the Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley continue to work on this site adding real-world examples of science, both good and bad, student misconceptions, and lesson plans for teachers through college. They have also reordered the classic scientific method, six-step list into a more realistic and interactive circular form. Check out how science works, the flowchart. They also have a science checklist to help kids understand what science is and what it's not. I do have a request for you and all the scientists who listen to TWIV, part of the website under resources is a section called The Call of Science, where scientists talk about how they became scientists. And that's why we ask guests on this show to tell us a little bit about how they became scientists. You guys need to put your stories there and share your love of communication of science. After all, you are the cutting edge of how science information can be shared with the general public. So I'm thinking that, that there, are some act, there are some ASV histories, uh, oral histories that were done many years ago that are somewhere on the web. Which we should, that's right. right. We, which we should link to at some yeah, point. Good. That'd be good. Thanks for all you do and all the work you put in. I learned much from TWIV, TWIM, and TWIP. And I will be in a minority here, but please don't add more episodes. If you do, I'll have to quit my job to keep up. <laughs> Actually, more TWIPs would be fun. Monster stories on a small scale. Thanks for being my teacher. So Judy is from San Diego, where she says it is 70 and sunny. That's about 22 degrees centigrade. So someone once wrote us, because we always say, what's the temperature in Gainesville? And he says 80 degrees. And someone in Europe says, I have no idea what 80 degrees is. Tell me in centigrade. <laughs> uh, by the way, I have a question. How many of you actually listen to TWIP? Raise your hands. Uh, 80 percent, right? Right. Not bad. Last year was 50 percent. Very good. All right. The next from the next one is from Attila or Attila. I don't know how to pronounce that. It's a Portuguese name. A T I L A. Attila. Attila. 
and it's not Attila. Right. Dear hosts, <laughs> on TWIV 139, you discussed how after, this gentleman's from Brazil, by the way, you discussed how after several passages in amoebal cultures, the Mimi virus gets bald and loses a big chunk of DNA. This reminded me of an annual review about this virus that I read some time ago where Clavery and Albergel mentioned that Mimi virus fibers serve to mimic the bacteria that are preyed by the acanth amoeba and to be phagocytosed. These fibers are even glycosylated to better copy the bacteria and can retain gram stating, which is the source of confusion behind the discovery of the virus. So it is not a big surprise that the disappearance of fibers is followed by the loss of the sugar-related genes. It could be that this amoeba used to culture the virus does not need the coding in order to be infected. The whole story behind the discovery of Mimi virus is due to its resemblance to bacteria. I don't remember if you talked about it already, but here goes a brief description. Mimi virus was mistook as a gram-negative intracellular bacterium during the analysis of a water sample from a cooling tower in search for Legionella. It could be stained and observed inside amoebas, but it could not be cultured and ribosomal 16S primers didn't work. According to the discoverers, among all the intra amoebal bacteria that constituted our original collection, one provided us with the most headaches, but ultimately the most exciting findings. When they looked at these bacteria under electron microscope, they saw the unmistakable icosahedral form of a virus, but a giant one. The name also came from a curious source. We have proposed the name Mimi virus partially as a reflection of its mimicry of microbes and partially as a tribute to one of our forefathers, DR, who was a doctor who taught tropical medicine and studied nutrition. When teaching his 10-year-old son about evolution, he, fer he referred to the last eukaryotic common ancestor as Mimi the amoeba. As for the complexity in biology that always comes up in discussions, there's a nice passage from The Great Influenza, a book that you recommended in TWIV 15. Quote, Leo Sillard, a prominent physicist, made this point when he complained that after switching from physics to biology, he never had a peaceful bath again. <laughs> As a physicist, he would soak in the warmth of a bathtub and contemplate a problem, turn it in his mind, reason his way through it. But once he became a biologist, he constantly had to climb out of the tub to look up a fact. That was before the internet, right? Now you could just take his iPhone in the bathtub and everything would be okay. Sorry about the long mail, full of quotes about things you have already discussed, but I love when you talk about other viruses besides those that make you sick. I like the ones about disease-causing viruses too, but discussions of viruses outside the realm of human disease are rare, and being able to hear them from you and your guests is a great opportunity. I would also like to ask you to forgive my bad English again, but as Alan says, you don't speak Portuguese very well too. <laughs> I don't speak it at all, do you, Rich? Obrigado. Right. Get so that thanks, right? thanks again for the rich and informative podcasts from one of your many Brazilian listeners. You know this fellow? No. no? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, Brazil is a big place. Uh, let's see, how are we doing? Okay, a few more. Uh, the next one is from Tim. My dear Twivists, we have three brilliant shows. We have Twiv, we have Twip, and now we have Twim. How long before Twif makes an appearance? Let's not leave our fine fungal friends in the dark. I think I'm pretty booked up already. <laughs> Keep up the fantastic work. You guys are a valuable resource for a kid who did humanities in high school and is trying to add to his scientific understanding during university before eventually applying for med school. Much love and respect. Tim is from Victoria, Australia. And uh, perhaps our last one would be from Adam. Hi guys, I'm a long time listener, first time emailer. I really loved the show. I was really intrigued by this week's show on XMRV number 136. I wonder how frequently recombination resuscitates endogenous retroviruses in nature, away from the contrivances of the laboratory, i.e. propagating human prostate cancer cell lines in mice. Do you think that human endogenous retroviruses, HERVs, are frequently revived in children whose parents carry both carry inactive retroviruses. If each parent carried a similar retrovirus that are inactive due to loss of genetic information in different portions of the virus, there might be a potential for the retroviruses to recombine and become active again once they are united within a new individual genome, that of the child. 
Thanks for the enlightening, inspiring, and entertaining podcast. Do you know? Do you know? Steve's out there. The Steve audience. Goff. So, do human herbs uh, <laughs> recombine? Do you think we just don't know it? Yeah. So in theory, it could happen, but we wouldn't know it because if they don't cause disease, you would never detect it, right? And we don't look for it. Good but, idea, though, from this uh, listener. Great. We, what, would you agree? I don't know if you're an Irv fan, but you, you work on retrovirus. Yeah, yeah, no, well, we used, to, yeah, we used to work on recombination with endogenous retrovirus. I, I, I was thinking it could happen, right? Yeah. But... Uh, if, it were, if, it, if it's not pathogenic, you never find it. It's only if the virus spreads then eventually at some point, but it would be many years probably before you might see that. So it's a good point, uh, Adam. Thanks for that. All right, the last part of TWIV is always a pick of the week, a science pick of the week, and I'm going to let Rich lead the way today. Okay, so this is another um, feed from my wife. She feeds me TWIV picks. Uh, actually, this is sort of indirect because this started with a, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times from a guy who is in the plasma physics laboratory at Princeton, and his op-ed about, was about how um, fusion is the energy source of the future. Okay? So I just kind of trace this back, and uh, he uh, mentioned an international collaboration to build a fusion reactor, uh, which is the collaboration is called ITER. I-T-E-R, which is, I had to look at the little video to figure this out. Apparently that's Latin for the way. And this is a multinational collaboration involving China, uh, the European Union, India, Japan, Korea, Russian, uh, uh, Russia, and the USA, whose goal it is to build a uh, fusion reactor. Uh, and the, apparently it's already underway in the south of France. It's a uh, machine called a, some of you may know about this, uh, a Tokamak, which it, it sounds amazing. They actually, you know, they're gonna do it. So the reaction is hydrogen and deuterium to generate energy, and it, it's at uh, the, uh, like hotter than the sun, right? So they have to contain this plasma field they contain it with magnets. This sounds right out of uh, Star Trek. They got a nice picture of the uh, machine and how it works uh, on their uh, website. And I have a kind of an apocalyptic view of what's going to happen to us <laughs> because there's too many people and we're, you know, trashing the place. And this gives me maybe a little bit of hope if they can actually pull this off because it looks like pretty clean energy. So. Have a look, it's an interesting website, and I wish them luck. Uh, I don't know, I could, it's not the NIH. I could not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how it's funded. Right. Uh, pro uh, presumably by con uh, contributions from uh, all of the uh, participating uh, governments. One of the complaints in the op-ed was that the US is kind of um, bringing up the rear in this whole thing. <laughs> All right, well, my pick is a article in the science section of the New York Times. It is entitled, First Place Sweep by American Girls at the First Google Science Fair. So Google made a science fair, and uh, these three young ladies, Shri Bose, Naomi Shah, and Lauren Hodge, took first prize in their age group out of 15 finalists at the Google Science Fair. So it's great that Google is encouraging this. And I think we have to encourage young people to keep going in science, and this is one way to do it. So check it out. It's a nice story, and it tells you all about how these girls were doing stuff since they were very, very young. It's got a great picture of them here. And they, they're holding their trophies. It looks like almost like their trophies are made out of Legos. Legos, yes. That would be right. All right, we also have a listener pick of the week. This is from Jing. Uh, he says, hi, virologist, just saw this book written by Rudolf Steiner in 1923, predicting that honeybees as a species would collapse in 80 to 100 years, with com which comes true with CCD. Could be a candidate for pick of the week. So this is a book called Bees by Rudolf Steiner, written in 1923, predicting the demise of honeybees. And we've talked a lot about colony collapse disorder uh, on TWIV. So that'll do it for TWIV at ASV. I'd like to thank 
everyone who's been involved in this. But for that, you can find TWIV at iTunes, at the Zoom Marketplace, at microbeworld.org. We also have a website, twiv.tv, where you can find our show notes, all of the letters that we read, uh, and links to our stories. We do love getting your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Julie Overbaugh is at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Thank you for joining us. It was fun. Stacy Schultz Cherry is at St. Jude Children's Hospital. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It wasn't as scary as I thought. No scary here. No, we don't scare. We don't do qualifying exams here in Twiv. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. My pleasure as always. Great fun. Uh, I want to thank our local host, Lou Mansky, for making this happen to the ASV Council for having us back. Maybe they'll have, them, have us back next year in, in Madison, and also to you guys in the audience. And I want to thank Wade and Tony for helping me set up the tech here beforehand. Uh, I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.